okay? What we know, though, is that almost none of us have heart rates that are in that. So that means that we regulate what your resting heart rate is. And we're also going to regulate it in other instances as well by providing signal to the SA node that will either increase heart rate or decrease heart rate. Okay? So when we do fun things like this, we say, Finn, we say that. Okay, how many of you have a watch on? Don't. Oh, I picked some of that. I should have looked better. Okay. You guys want me to mess with Finley's heart rate? Finley, have you ever been embarrassed in your life? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. You want to tell us about it? Are you a singer? <laughs> Even better. You want to stand up on your desk and sing? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Okay. What am I doing to finish? I'm pretty much feeling a little bit stressed. A little bit, okay. What is happening to her heart rate? It's up, right? Thank you, Penny. You may sit down. Okay. I am raising her heart rate by stressing her out, raising levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine that signal to the SA node that raise the heart rate. Okay. Conversely, everybody can do this, okay. I want you all to close your eyes. And I want you to take a five second breath in through your nose. Hold it for a beat. And five seconds out through your mouth. Do that for about three cycles. Okay. Uh -huh. If you've done three cycles, we've lowered everybody's heart rate. Okay. Doing that deep breathing technique increases acetylcholine, increases parasympathetic nervous system activation, and that will lower the heart rate. Okay. That's why they tell you when you're stressed, breathe, right? Breathe. Fun things are when you have a toddler who's having a crazy fit because she's tired. So what happened to Black also last night and you tell her to breathe and she says, I can't, Daddy, I can't. You're like, why not? She's like, I don't know how to breathe. Yeah. It's like, okay, this is law for me. She gets real worked up about some things, especially when she's tired. So um, she was very upset. She was grabbing at me and she broke the bracelet that she made for me. So we're, we're remaking it, but she popped it and then she just lost her shit. Um, after, and I'm like, yeah, like it's fine. We've got all the beads, but you just you basically on a hook for a little knot. Like, it's fine. She was inconsolable, which was very cute, but also, anyway, kids when they get tired. Okay, so this is what happened. Highly trained people, heart rate thirty to forty. Okay, they have elevated parasympathetic function at rest, lower sympathetic function at rest. Okay, that's why the heart rate is low. <laughs> Sedentary people tends to be the other way around. Higher resting heart rate, more sympathetic input, less parasympathetic. During exercise, heart rate will increase in a very linear manner. Okay? You're resting, it's at seven. You get up and you start walking, it's at 100. You jog, it's at 130. Okay? You jog fast, it's at 150. Ugh. Okay? <laughs> you sprint and it's at 185 or something like that. Okay. This is why we use heart rate to estimate exercise intensity. Because remember before, epinephrine and norepinephrine increase in direct proportion to exercise intensity. They're meant to drive fat mobilization and glycogen breakdown in the liver. They also drive increases in heart rate. Okay. So that's what's happening. That's how we regulate that. All of you can calculate, and you should have done this before in health and fitness and other classes, you can calculate your age predicted max heart rate. Okay. It is 220 minus your age. So most of you in here, it's going to be about 200 beats per minute ish. Okay. Ish. Mine, on the other hand, is about 175. Okay. As we will see by the thick equation later on today, all of you should be able to have a larger cardiac output than me because you can raise your max heart rate. 
you can raise your heart rate more than I can. Right? And I can raise more than, say, my father, who is 76. Okay. So that's going to be an important kind of thing. There's these other equations that are not too 20 minus your age. We're scientists. We're never happier than we're taking something that works perfectly well and making it ever so slightly different in playing it slightly more accurate. You get like a one beat per minute difference. If you do it that way, literally no one cares. Okay. The 220 minus the age is the way to go. Okay. Let's make, no. Okay. That's not going. Okay. So regulation of heart rate, as we've already kind of mentioned, is mostly controlled by autonomic nervous system input. This is extrinsic, things that are outside of the heart providing input. So sympathetic nervous system, epinephrine, norepinephrine, release on the SA node, raise heart rate. Parasympathetic input, okay, or acetylcholine release into the SA node lowers heart rate, okay? That's the primary way that we control things, but I want to point out something in the next slide that is probably going to be intuitive to you guys, but I always sound to be a little bit, a little bit wonky when we talk about what's going on. Okay. And so if you look at this particular slide, okay, you guys are sitting there, you're in rest. Let's say your heart rate's at 50 beats per minute. All of you guys, I'm not stressing anybody out. You guys all have some amount of parasympathetic input that is predominating right now. Okay. When I want to raise your heart rate, and we had Finley say that the first thing that happened was not necessarily that she released epinephrine nor epinephrine. The first thing that happened was acetylcholine release slowed down and it stopped. We removed parasympathetic first. So you've got a person that's resting, you have vagus, which is parasympathetic coming from the vagus nerve. You've got input from the parasympathetic. If I want to raise heart rate, I can remove parasympathetic and that will raise us back up towards sort of intrinsic resting rate. Once I get to there, then I can begin to add epinephrine and norepinephrine on top and that will raise us further. Okay, does that make sense? I've always had a hard time kind of understanding kind of the hows and the whys, why that would be the way to do things, but that's how it tends to operate, okay? You guys can also see this will be important for when we talk about stroke volume regulation. Um, I really like this sort of thing. So you can see SA node, AV node, right? And you can see the bundle of hits of the Purkinje fibers. And what you can note from all of this is that we get parasympathetic input basically only on the SA node in the atria, but we get sympathetic input into the AV node, the SA node, and the ventricles, okay? So in addition to raising the heart rate, Sympathetic input will also make the cardiac muscle contraction stronger, which will be very, very good for stroke volume increase. You put for LPNS increase to cardiac output as well. Okay. So I like the visual on all of this. I don't think this was in the in the slides that I had that I had from before. Okay. Questions about that? That's how we regulate heart rate. Okay. That's how we regulate heart rate. Okay. Now, once you begin to move, there's going to be a little bit of additional input from all of this, okay? You have peripheral receptors in blood vessels, in your joints, and in your muscles, okay? They're going to be what we call chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors. They sense movement, they sense biochemicals, and that's going to also provide us some input back to the vagus nerve, back to the sympathetic nervous system to help us control things, okay? So if you start moving and changing your position, breathing goes up immediately, heart rate goes up immediately because of the change in these things. They also tend, the peripheral receptors tend to respond to increases in metabolic byproducts. So as metabolism increases, we're also going to get sort of signals back into, especially the sympathetic nervous system to raise the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Okay. So we covered this. We covered cardiac output. All right. So let's talk about let's talk about stroke volume. 
Okay. As I told you guys the other day that of all the things that we have, so far, it's probably the most important thing, cardiovascular variable, um, that is different among people that helps us understand and relate to, to fitness. Okay. So larger stroke volume leads to larger cardiac output. Okay. Larger stroke volume leads to a larger cardiac output. During exercise, there'll be a slide on the right here. I'll go ahead and tell you guys. During exercise, stroke volume increases up to about when you're jogging, and then it levels off and it does not increase anymore. So from rest to walking, stroke volume goes up. Walking to jogging, stroke volume goes up more. Jogging to jogging fast to sprinting, stroke volume is basically going to be flat. Okay. It's basically going to be flat. There's some important reasons behind this that I want us to be able to understand, okay? Because it helps us understand why it goes up in some instances, why it doesn't go up in others, and why some of the changes that are going to need to occur when we, um, when we occur with the training are going to help us raise stroke volume, raise cardiac volume, okay? So the first thing that happens that helps us to increase stroke volume is a phenomenon or a variable called preload, okay? Preload. Preload is in many ways another way to describe in diastolic volume. Preload is the amount of blood in the left ventricle at the end of ventricular diastole. So it's basically how full is the left ventricle, okay? The more blood that we put into the left ventricle, the larger the preload, the more that's going to be, that's going to be ejected out as stroke volume, okay? And so that's what this graph shows. It shows ventricular in diastolic volume. So as it increases, what happens to they're calling it here ventricular performance. This is basically stroke volume, right? And so as we fill the ventricle more and more, there's this sort of positively accelerated increase in the amount of blood that leaves, okay? This is primarily driven by something we've already talked about in class. They just call it something different in class, okay? You all probably learned about this in human phrase. It's called the Frank Starling law or the Frank Starling mechanism of the heart. Okay. And what happens is as we fill the left ventricle more and more, we stretch the cardiac muscle. Blood comes in and the heart stretches out. Okay. The more it stretches, the more forceful sort of the contraction is going to be when it eventually contracts and relaxes. This is the exact same concept as this. I'm gonna jump, so I squat down first, then I jump. It's what we call a stretch shortening cycle. We stretch it, we store elastic energy, then it contracts, so we get the force from the, the contraction and the force from the elastic energy, okay? That's called the Frank Starling Law or the Frank Starling Mechanism of the Heart. <laughs> And that is why the bigger the preload, the more stretch we get, the more forceful the contraction, the larger the stroke volume. Okay? Now, at some point, you max out preload. You can only put so much blood in. At some point, you max out stretch from that preload. So you can only get an increase up to some point okay, from preload. <laughs> This is really, really important. You guys want to know how I make the preload go up? You might do a handstand. He says as he looks at the gymnast in class. <laughs> right? Anybody want to try a handstand? You do a handstand, I make the preload go up. You know why? Gravity. Okay? Hang yourself upside down. Gravity helps pull blood back to the heart. Preload goes up. Okay? The other really simple way is do just what I'm doing right now, okay? I am walking, therefore I am 
contracting muscles. I'm squishing the veins in my body. This thing called the muscle pump. I walk, I squish the veins, it pushes blood back towards my heart. It makes preload go up. Okay? It makes preload go up. That's why they tell you to not stop. If you've run a race, you've done a bike race, you've done something, they want you to walk when you're finished, which is the last thing in the world you ever want to do right when you're done is to keep going. You've got to keep contracting those muscles to push blood back to the heart so that preload will stay elevated and you don't faint or pass out. Okay? <laughs> this gets at, so the idea of changing body position and the idea of using the muscle pump Preload is, in so many ways, very, very much dependent upon the idea of a concept called venous return. Venous return is how much blood can we get out of the veins back into the heart at any given time. So anything we can do to increase venous return makes preload go up, makes stroke volume go up, which then means potentially cardiac output can increase. Okay? When you exercise, you immediately increase venous return. You contract your muscles, pushes more blood back. You breathe more deeply, okay? It lowers the pressure in your chest cavity and creates suction that draws blood out of the veins back to the heart, okay? So blood pressure goes up, more driving pressure pushes more blood back to the heart. That's the big thing, okay? Another way that I can make preload and therefore stroke volume go up or change is blood volume. If I give all of you more blood right now, then it actually increases venous return. Okay? The larger your blood volume, the more venous return you get. The larger your preload, the larger your stroke volume. Okay? One of the key adaptations to aerobic exercise training is you guys will gain about a liter of blood. About a liter. When your blood volume increases, you have more red blood cells, and it makes venous return, it makes preload go up, which raises stroke volume, which is really, really powerful. Okay? So we've talked about the muscle pump a little bit. We talked about posture. Heart size is another deal. If I give you a bigger left ventricle, you can put more blood in it, therefore preload will go up. Okay? Therefore preload will go up. That's another adaptation to aerobic exercise training, is your heart gets bigger. Okay, you're like the Grinch. Right. At the end of Christmas, your heart grows three times the size or something. Doesn't grow three times, but it will get bigger. Therefore, more blood can go in. And so we can we can manage that. Okay. Do you guys talk about the muscle pump at all? They talk about the muscle pump in, in human phys or any other classes. Yeah, we've all seen it before. So here's a, a unique thing about veins, right? Veins are very squishy. Veins are very squishy. This contrast them to arteries in some ways. They also have valves in them that prevent backwards flow. So what happens is in the vein, when you contract a muscle, you do something, the force from those muscles, you squish the veins. And because of the valves, we increase pressure in a place and it forces the blood forward. Okay? Cannot go backwards, it forces it forward and that increases venous repair. Okay? That's how we're going to get more, the more venous return, more preload. And it's just going to help us raise stroke volume. You guys can see as we start to exercise, stroke volume goes up. Part of it is because of the muscle pump. Okay. And that's going to help us out from a cardiac output standpoint. Okay. Now, I want to mention another thing about regulation of stroke volume. And this one is a thing that can help us in some instances, but also really hurts us, especially if you're an older person. Like I am. Okay. It's a concept of what's called afterload. Now, afterload, again, I don't like the terminology of it, but what it really is denoting is afterload is a measure of resistance to a ventricular contraction. Technically, afterload is in systolic volume. How much blood is left in the ventricle after it has contracted? Okay. A larger afterload means that less blood left in the heart. If less has gone out, okay, there's going to be more that's in there. The primary thing that affects afterload, okay, is blood pressure. 
People that are hypertensive have a higher pressure in their aorta. They have a higher pressure in their ground and blood vessels. Therefore, the heart has to contract more forcefully to create a pressure gradient to overcome that blood pressure. So people that are hypertensive tend to have reduced throat volume because it's more difficult for them to eject blood out of the heart because their aortic pressure is high. So they have a higher afterload. Okay. One thing that most people can do, and even people that are hypertensive can do this, okay? But this may in some ways come back around with some of those drugs that I, that I put on the assignment. If I want to make your afterload smaller, I need to decrease aortic blood pressure. I need to decrease pressure basically everywhere else in the body. And I do that by vasodilating a bunch of blood vessels. So I make the pressure fall out away from the heart, which means that there's going to be less resistance to the blood trying to move, a bigger pressure gradient, as it's lower out in the periphery than it is in the heart, and more will leave after load will go down. Okay. Another way to increase afterload is to do valsalva maneuver. You guys, you all have heard about valsalva, right? Essentially, valsalva is there so that when you lift things that are heavy, you don't swoosh and break all of your internal organs. Okay, you contract your diaphragm, you raise pressure inside the thoracic cavity very, very high, so you have something to kind of hold things in place when you're doing squats, right? or a bench press, or lunges, or I don't know, whatever it is, it is that you're doing on those things, okay? So the problem of blood pressure, and this is why having chronically elevated blood pressure is a problem from a cardiovascular disease standpoint, okay? In order to try, you have, you have high blood pressure, therefore your afterload goes up. That's not great, the body does not like that. So it tries to compensate for that by leading to hypertrophy of the left ventricle so that it can contract more forcefully and drive more blood out and get afterwards to go back to a normal place. The problem of that is that this is what is called pressure load hypertrophy or concentric cardiac hypertrophy. And it leads to a thickening of the left ventricular yep. wall, an excessive thickening, which then makes it more susceptible to sudden cardiac arrest. Okay? So people that have chronically high blood pressure have very thick left ventricular walls because they've had to contract very forcefully to overcome that blood pressure. To push blood. And that makes them more prone to cardiac arrest. Okay? So that's going to be, that's going to be part of our, Part of our issues that are going to go on there. Okay. All right. So we've talked about these. So let's talk now about what's going to go on in the arteries and arterioles that help us control blood pressure, but also help us control what we do most things together. So I've added a couple of pictures in here of some electron micrographs and some things that are going to show what blood vessels in the arterial tree is going to look like. It's just there for your, for your kind of purposes, like research purposes. I'm not going to draw something that I ask you guys to identify. Is this a primary arterial? Is it a secondary arterial? I just want you guys to visually be able to see those things. What I do want you to be able to do, though, okay, is to understand a couple of the special structures and what they look like on arterioles that allow them to change their diameter, that allow them to control both blood pressure and where blood goes. Okay. So they have smooth muscle, which we talked about the other day. Okay, it's going to go around the outside. On the inside of arterioles, there's a single layer of cells called the endothelium. The endothelium. Okay, the endothelium is, or it's going to represent cells that respond to changes in what's going on with blood flow through those arterioles and can help us signal to relax or contract those arterioles. Okay. And then into and kind of around the smooth muscle, 
we have what's called perivascular sympathetic nerves, and I'll show you a picture of this. All that this means is there's sympathetic nervous system innervation into the smooth muscle around these blood vessels. And that sympathetic input will tell the smooth muscle to contract okay, and help us change vessel diet. So here's what all of this looks like under a microscope. Okay. The top one, you see all the little rings? It's a blood vessel that looks like the Mitchell and Tyler. Okay. Those are rings of smooth muscle around an arterial. Okay. So if you see them in this way, then you can hopefully understand that if it if they contract, they will squish the arterial down, they relax, they will get it. Okay. What you see here in this one is they stand for the sympathetic nerves that, that are going to innervate the smooth muscle. And then they got rid of and ate away the smooth muscle and all of the vessels. So all you can see that's left is all of the little sympathetic nerves that are going to be there. Okay? So you can note then that, right, it's very, very extensive. So there's lots of ability for the sympathetic nervous system to tell smooth muscle what to do. Okay? So this allows us to very, very tightly control the diameter arterial. And that's the primary way that we control where blood goes in your body. And it's one of the primary ways that we control blood pressure as well, by altering sort of the, the diameter of these of these particular vessels. Okay. Okay, so we talked about mean arterial pressure, we talked about blood distribution. Let me introduce then the concept of how and why from sort of a fluid dynamic standpoint, the altering vessel diameter is going to affect where blood goes, why it's going to affect blood pressure. Okay. So what you can see here on the left is the same arterial, here it is what we would, it's what we would have called vasoconstricted. So it's squished down and has the smallest yeah. diameter. Here's normal, okay? And then down here on the very bottom is what we call vasodilated. So it has relaxed the smooth muscle and the diameter has gotten bigger. So the way this works, okay, we have to understand a little bit of physics to understand how fluids move through tubes, okay? All of you understand this intuitively because you've used a garden hose to spray water at a mother, a sister, a family or somebody, right? You want to spray the water out, you put your thumb or your finger over the end of the hose, it shrinks down the end there, which raises the pressure of the fluid inside of it so it will shoot far off, okay? We all understand this, but I'm going to try to explain to you the physics behind it. Okay, you do not have to know these equations. All I want you to know and understand is why changing diameter or the radius of these tubes has such a profound effect on flow. Okay, all right. So we have something called Ohm's law. Ohm's law tells us that the flow of air or a fluid through some sort of a tube is going to be equal to the difference in pressure from one end of the tube to the other divided by what we call resistance. Anybody had physics too? Anybody had physics too? Bless you all and a couple of y'all. All right. Y'all want to explain to us what resistance is? No. So we have resistance to fluids, we have resistance to air, we have resistance to um, electricity and a lot of What resistance really means is how difficult or easy is it to make it move? It's just what it says, okay? So Ohm's law tells us that flow is equal to the delta of pressure, the difference in pressure over resistance. We can use Poiseuille's law to define what resistance is. Resistance is equal to eight, multiplied by N, multiplied by L, right? Where N is viscosity of the fluid, blood. L is the length of the tube or the length of the blood vessel. Divided by pi, multiplied by the radius of that vessel to the fourth power. Length of your vessels doesn't change. Blood viscosity doesn't change very much. 
So for all those things out, so resistance is basically eight divided by pi multiplied by radius of the fourth pi is a constant. It doesn't change. Eight doesn't change. So we throw everything out of that equation except for the radius of the vessel. Okay. So resistance to flow is primarily determined by the diameter or the radius of that particular bulk dust. And so because it's to the fourth power, any very small change has profound effects on resistance. Okay. So if we put these two things together, you get a thing called Poisson's equation, which is flow is equal to delta pressure multiplied by pi multiplied by radius of the fourth power divided by a length of the vessel of viscosity. So basically, blood flow is equal to the difference in pressure multiplied by the size of that vessel. Okay, the bigger the vessel, the more flow. Smaller the vessel, the less flow. The bigger the change in pressure, the bigger the difference in pressure, the more flow. All right. So this illustrates, in essence, our ability to raise blood pressure in the heart is the front end of the pressure equation. Our ability to lower pressure out in the periphery is the back end. So we can use changes in blood pressure in the heart and the periphery to generate this delta pressure. And then we use our ability to change the, the diameter or the radius of our blood vessels right here. And because this is to the fourth power, this is the big thing, okay? If I dilate a blood vessel, more flow goes there, period, end of discussion. If I constrict that blood vessel, less flow goes there. End of discussion. Okay? That's the big thing. So if I want blood to go to a tissue, I dilate the blood vessels that go there. I dilate the arterioles that go to that tissue. When I don't want it to go somewhere, I may as well constrict it. Okay? So right now, if you have breakfast, you vasodilated to your stomach and your intestines and your liver and your kidneys. Skeletal muscle is mostly vasoconstricted. You begin to exercise, and we send some signals, and we flip all of that around. We vasoconstrict your stomach, intestine, kidneys, liver to some extent, a little bit less than the liver, and we vasodilate the working skeletal muscle. And so that's how we redistribute where blood goes. Okay? In that same way, I'm sorry to pick on Finley again. Anybody remember? Did Finley get a little bit flushed? Feel like you were a little bit flushed, Finley? For sure. For sure, just a little, okay? Vasodilation to the skin, blood goes to the skin. Vasoconstriction also, okay? And so these are the things, and this is how we control where all the blood goes in your body. It is very, very, it's not by the heart very much. It's not by the large arteries very much, okay? They just are push the blood, carry it around, but it's all of these arterioles that lead from the big arteries into a specific tissue where we constrict or dilate and that controls how much blood flow that tissue gets. Right. Does that make sense, guys? It's really, 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 really important. Okay? Really important. So if I told you, as I just did, you start to exercise, you get flow going to muscle away from your stomach. Okay. How does that happen? Right? What are going to be these signals that tell the arterioles to change their diameter? Well, one of those is a process called autoregulation. Autoregulation is basically what it is probably called local control of blood flow. And local control. The tissue tells the blood vessel, bring us more, bring us less blood. Okay. Much of this is controlled by O2 demand, potassium release, hydrogen, lactic acid. All of those things are going to lead to vasodilation. So metabolism in a tissue leads to vasodilation in the arterioles that go to that tissue, okay? Bring us more oxygen, bring us more fat, bring us more glucose so we can continue to run the okay? 
As that begins to happen, though, then the velocity of blood moving through those vessels also tends to go up. Flow goes up. Velocity goes up. And that releases something from the endothelium. It's called nitric oxide, NO. It's not laughing gas, it's not nitrox, it's nitric oxide. <laughs> blood has a bunch of little cells in it, okay? Blood is not just water. Anybody ever seen anyone sandblast something? Our neighbors had like had somebody come and sandblast to take paint off of an old car. We just sand all over our all over our yard for years. But imagine it gets fluid with a bunch of little sand particles. Okay, that's what your blood is. So as it moves through a vessel, it's not just water. There's all of these little these little cells in there that are going to create friction and rub against that endothelial cell line. As that happens then it creates a thing called shear stress. Shear stress is just stress from things going and sort of running parallel to each other. It's, called, it's like you can have wind shear, all kinds of things. This is shear stress. That tells the endothelium, release nitric oxide, cause vasodilation, so that the blood velocity in that shear will go down. Okay. We measure this, like the Pelowan measures this in his lab. Okay, your ability to respond to shear stress is one of the key hallmarks of how much atherosclerosis you have in your blood vessels. Okay, you have fatty deposits that cover the endothelium, and you cannot respond correctly to an increase in blood flow to a tissue. Then the blood pressure in that tissue goes up. And it can lead to aneurysms and, and a whole host of other other sort of cardiovascular problems. Okay. That's where it's the impairment of this from atherosclerosis that's also going to be a big part of the cardiovascular. We also have what's called extrinsic neural control, and that is going to be the sympathetic nervous system is going to provide input. In many tissues, epinephrine and norepinephrine cause vaso vasoconstriction. You exercise, epi nor epi go up, it binds to receptors on the smooth muscle and all the blood vessels in your liver, your kidneys, your stomach, your intestine, it causes vasoconstriction. Okay. In some tissues, it causes vasodilation, like in your skin and those things. Skeletal muscle, it's a little bit wonky. It would take, take us two days to explain kind of how all that is regulated. I just want you guys to appreciate though that generally sympathetic nervous system controls blood distribution by either causing contraction or relaxation. And it all comes down to, you guys learn about different kind of like alpha adrenergic receptors, beta adrenergic receptors and things in, in human fist. It all comes down to blood vessels in different parts of the body have different concentration of these alpha and beta receptors for sympathetic nervous system input. Okay. And so some of them cause constriction, some of them cause dilation, but the distribution is different. So the same signal, the same epi and norepi can cause vasoconstriction in the splenic regions and vasodilation in the same. Okay. So the body only has to send one signal, but the tissues will respond individually in the midst of all of that. Okay. Okay. I promise you guys, there will be a short answer function about this on the test. Okay? I promise you. It's something about explain how we control blood distribution, explain auto conduction, explain extrinsic neural control, yada, yada, yada. Okay? Why is it not advancing? Okay. Probably my favorite thing, what I think is the least appreciated component of the cardiovascular system, which is blood. Okay, it's the blood. So the heart is a pump. Blood vessels are basically tubes or pipes. It's blood where all of the actual stuff that we need is going to be held. Okay. We use blood to transport CO2 and oxygen. We use the blood to transport hormones and neurotransmitters. We use the blood 
two friends for it, okay? Glucose in free fatty acids. We use blood to help us regulate body temperature, which we'll talk about for the final test. And we also use blood to help us buffer and control the acidity of various tissues in the body. Okay, it is really, really, really important. And I don't feel like we talk about it very much. Um, I used to have, and I've, I've lost in one of our moves. Um, I used to bring in, we would do this, I'd bring in two meter bottles um, that I had filled with water with red food coloring in. And I would set them down and be like, okay, for the majority of our probably ladies in class, you guys have somewhere between four and five liters of blood in your body. You get two liters. Guys, y'all are probably, just because of body size, more like five to six, okay? We can set those up. That's how much blood is in your body. And it's gonna vary across people. It's very, very sensitive to state of training. It's in some ways sensitive to hydration status. It's not a whole, whole lot, but a little bit of that, okay? All right, now, what is blood made up of? A majority of blood is water, okay? Water. The rest of your blood is going to be what we call hematocrit, which is, in essence, blood cells, okay? Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, okay? In a normal person, and by normal, I mean someone that doesn't live at altitude, I mean, someone that is not taking artificial erythropoietin as though you want to be in the Tour de France, you have somewhere between 40 and probably 45% of your blood is red blood cell. Your hematocrit percentage is in that, and if I say 45 to 50% here, it's really probably 40 to 45% in most people, okay? which means you're somewhere between about 55 and 60% water in the vessel, in, in the blood, okay? Now, we need the water to help us transport things, okay? Glucose, fat, hormones, those. We need the red blood cells to carry oxygen. That's their primary job is to carry oxygen, okay? They will also carry CO2, but they primarily exist to help us carry oxygen. We did not have red blood cells our ability to move around and do things and run metabolism in the way that we do would not exist. It absolutely would not exist. Okay. I'm sure you guys have seen all this before, but red blood cells look like little donuts without a hole in them, okay? The big thing about red blood cells is they have a molecule in them called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin contains iron, okay? And iron has a very strong positive charge, it's plus two. Iron loves to grab oxygen, okay? It loves it. And so we're gonna use the iron in the hemoglobin in our red blood cells to help us bind and carry on those red blood cells way more oxygen than we otherwise could, okay? So there are four oxygen molecules that bind to each molecule of hemoglobin. And there are about somewhere north of 200 million hemoglobin molecules in a single red blood cell. You can then do the math, right? There's like a billion molecules of oxygen on any one red blood cell, and you have hundreds of millions of red blood cells in your body. So huge, huge, huge capacity to store and carry and move around oxygen because of the anatomy and the structure of red blood cells. Okay. because of all of this. And this is why if I manipulate your red blood cells, I could give you guys a pint of red blood cells right now, and you can immediately carry more oxygen in your blood than you could five minutes before. More oxygen in your blood means there's more that you can get into the mitochondria and skeletal muscle, the more energy you can make available. I can just better in your entire more red blood cells makes your blood volume go up. Remember, blood volume contributes to venous return, which contributes to preload, which makes stroke volume go up. So manipulating things in the blood is one of the most powerful ways to improve aerobic activity. All right.
So let's talk about what happens when you begin to exercise. Very simple, okay? Everything in the cardiovascular system outside of blood flow to the splenic regions goes up, okay? Cardiac output increases. It goes up because both heart rate and stroke volume go up. So you go from resting to walking, walking to jogging, heart rate increases, stroke volume increases, cardiac output increases. Where we send that blood also changes and is wildly important. Okay. We're going to send the blood that you have away from kidneys, spleen, stomach. We're going to send it to the, to the skin. We're going to send it to skeletal muscle. Okay. And we're going to send it to the heart. All of this means that we raise cardiac output and we raise the amount or the percentage of that cardiac output that gets presented to or shown to the heart, the brain, and to working skeletal muscle in a given period of time. And this improves our ability for those tissues to get oxygen, for those tissues to get glucose and fat, and for those tissues to get the hormones that we've increased in order to, to help them function properly, okay? That's sort of the, the kind of big take home from all of that. So I'm gonna show you a graph, I'll do this in this order, and I'll show you the graph first, and then we'll go back and talk about why. Here's a graph with running on the treadmill and an increasing speed on the x-axis and cardiac output in liters per minute on the y-axis, okay? So you guys can imagine that right out here at about five, that's rest, you're just sitting, okay? This is in kilometers per hour, so roughly multiply it by about two. So we're walking pretty slow here, okay? Walking fast, we start jogging, boom, boom, boom. And at some point out here, very, very intensely, we can make cardiac output level off and get maxed out, okay? That's how we're gonna, that's how we're gonna manage all of that. So cardiac output, tends to increase in a very linear fashion with an increase in exercise. Okay? This is because cardiac output is going to provide oxygen and nutrients and remove carbon dioxide from working skeletal muscle. So it needs to increase very much in proportion to the energy demand in a given tissue. Okay? And so that's why this is going to be one of the big primary determinants. Whichever one of you in here can raise your cardiac output to the highest absolute level is likely, likely going to be our best endurance output. Right? Really, it's your cardiac output related to sort of your skeletal muscle mass um, is the better way to do it. But that's going to be the big, going to be the big takeaway. So why does cardiac output go up during exercise? Well, heart rate increases and stroke volume increase, and those two things multiplied by each other give us. Cardiac output. Okay. They're going to give us cardiac output. As you will see in the coming slides, stroke volume plateaus off at about 40 to 60 percent of max heart rate or max VO2, depending upon how well trained the person is. So, really, in most people, once we get over kind of a job, the only way you're going to further increase your cardiac output is to increase your heart rate. Okay. The only way you're going to make it go up is to increase your heart rate. I'll show you guys what that looks like, okay, in the other sort of uh, responses that we're going to have. So here's the heart rate response. This is the same graph, okay? The same treadmill speeds on the x-axis, the heart rate response on the y-axis, okay? Very nice, very tight, very linear increase in heart rate that we see with increase in exercise and increase in increase in power loss. Okay. This is why an Apple Watch, a Fitbit, and all these things, all these watches and various things, why well, they all use heart rate to guesstimate energy expenditure and to guesstimate sort of how fit and things you are. They just look at this particular response because it's going to change. It's very easy to measure now, and it's relatively accurate at estimating things. Okay. All right. So I feel like I put these in, in an order that I did not really intend. I'm going to think about that here in a moment. It makes more sense. Let's look at stroke volume. Okay. Same graph. Stroke volume goes up. We kind of get to a job and then, for the most part, levels off. Okay. 
for the most part, it's going to level off. All right. The key question of all of this is why does it level off? Okay. Why does stroke volume level off? And do we have any control over sort of when it does and those types? Okay. Anybody have any ideas? Why does stroke volume level off? I only have so much blood in the body. Okay, good. There's only so much blood. The left ventricle is only so big. It can only stretch so much with preload. It can only contract so forcefully because of how much muscle it has. So the idea of what we call contractility can only go up so much. Okay. And so those are going to be the primary things. Is that one of the things that happens is we exercise. Venus return goes up, so we get more preload. Okay? We stretch because we get more preload, so contractility goes up. We get epinephrine and norepinephrine that makes contractility go up. So it's going to drive this increase, but at some point, it plateaus off. Okay. Fun exercise. Uh, who in class is 21? Okay. Looking around. Kayla, you can sit here. Stand up. That's about right. Yeah, y'all are roughly, roughly the same height, roughly the same time. Y'all are both 21? Okay. What is their age predicted max heart rate? 199. Okay. No difference between the two of them. At maximal exercise, both of them should be able to get to 199 beats per minute. Which one of them is going to have the largest? Cardiac output and therefore the largest VO2 max. The one with the bigger stroke volume. Who has the bigger stroke volume? Better training. Okay. In people that are thinking, consider. In people that are the same age. Okay. In people that are close to the same age, heart rate does not matter for determining cardiac output. Your max is going to be basically the same. What matters is your stroke volume. Okay. Now we would have to ask them some questions. Who has the biggest blood volume? Who's got the largest heart for their body size and things? But whichever one of them has the largest stroke volume when it plateaus will have the largest, the ability to have the largest cardiac output. Okay? And that is why. Stroke volume is the variable that we care about okay, when trying to assess people that are roughly the same age and their aerobic fitness, or at least the cardiovascular contributions to their aerobic fitness. I tell this in some ways in, in health and fitness, and I say the most likely scenario is that one of them has a larger heart than the other, a literal larger heart. Okay. Whichever one of them that is, likely has, will have the largest stroke. So in that way, anatomically, the person with the largest heart per their body size should win the race. Okay. And that's one of the things that we can that we can try to get at and understand. Okay. So I intended for us to take our quiz today. I still have a few slides that I would like to get to before we do that. So if you guys want to just take it and see how you do, you want me to postpone it and I'll take it first thing Monday. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I'll have to if you guys will look, don't take it. Don't do it now. It's gonna open um in like two minutes. Don't take it. I'll reset it and I'll put it out and we'll do it first thing in class on Monday. Okay. All right. So all right, I'm gonna back up then because I went in a little bit of a little bit of different things. One of the things we didn't talk about as to why stroke volume will plateau is partly related to an increase in heart rate. It's partly related to an increase in heart rate. So what this particular sort of cartoon is showing is one cardiac cycle. One cardiac cycle. We have a period of systole and a period of diastole that lasts about 0.8 seconds. This is a resting heart rate of about 75 beats per minute. OK, 
okay? During very high intensity exercise, your heart rate's at, let's say, 180 beats per minute, okay? At about 180. You have now shrunk the time of a cardiac cycle to about a third of a second. So from 0.8 seconds to about 0.3, okay? We have also now shrunk the amount of time that it's contracting. We've also really shrunk the amount of time that it's relaxed, okay? In, at very, very high heart rates, this can contribute to the plateau in stroke volume because diastole becomes so short that there's not enough time to fully fill up the left ventricle. No matter what your blood volume is, no matter what the muscle pump is doing, there's physically not enough time to push a bunch of blood into the heart. So that can also cause it to plateau off. Okay? At very, very high exercise intensities, especially in untrained people, stroke volume not doesn't just plateau, it actually bends down and begins to get a little bit at very, very high intensities. One of the hallmarks of people that are very highly trained is they don't show a decline in stroke volume at very high. Okay? They don't show that. Okay. We talked about those things. We've talked about blood distribution. So this is going to illustrate what happens during exercise. I know I showed you guys the thing on Monday that basically cardiac output goes up, blood goes to the muscles the heart, the brain, it goes away from other places. I like these graphs because I think it provides a different visual representation of that exact same idea. And so what you can see is this is relative blood flow to a tissue. This is absolutely, okay? Relative is the percentage of whatever the cardiac output is, okay? And so basically this is 100% of cardiac output and the different colors on here represent different tissues. So at rest, you can see of your five liters per minute of cardiac output, a majority is going to kidney, liver, stomach, intestines, some to the skin, right? Some to skeletal muscle. Blue is going to be the brain, and then green is going to be the heart. And then notice how everything shifts, right? Light exercise, so walking, jogging, kind of maximal exercise. The big note is that splenic regions, get less and less of your cardiac output. Skeletal muscle gets more. At light and moderate skin get more, but then it begins to get shut down. And basically at maximal exercise, you're sending almost all of the blood in your body to skeletal muscle. Okay. This is the exact same data. It's just shown as the height of the bar represents the change in cardiac output. And then the distribution of the colors in the bar is showing this sort of relative, what is going where, okay? Five liters per minute, 12 liters per minute when you're walking, 20 when you're jogging, you're at maximal, maybe it's closer to 30, right? And then you can see so cardiac output goes up, but then also the percentage of that cardiac output, most of it goes to skeletal muscle, is gonna increase. The part that's going to splenic regions goes down. Heart and brain are gonna stay relatively similar in an absolute sense because they just need X amount. That's going to say heart goes up a little bit as we go along. Okay. I like these because they show the same data from I showed you guys on Monday, but just in a little bit of a different way. Okay. Why does this happen? <coughs> Why does it happen? Why is the blood going to scale the muscle? How is the game? Why is it going there? There's more oxygen in Good. That's where metabolism is highest. We need the oxygen there. So it goes. How did we get there? Well, auto regulation. O2 levels, hydrogen levels, potassium levels drive vasodilation to those tissues. So that's where the blood goes. Okay. Nervous system input. Vasodilates the muscle, vasoconstricts the other place. That's where it goes away. Vasodilates the skin. That's how it is. Okay. That's why this is 
in some ways so important. Okay, so blood pressure is pretty simple. During exercise, blood pressure or systolic blood pressure increases. I should say that. Systolic pressure goes up. Okay? The left ventricle contracts more forcefully. That drives the increase in blood pressure. Pressure of blood leaving the heart goes up. This is good. We need this because, remember, flow is directly related to the difference in pressure at the starting tube between the heart and out where the blood needs to go. So if I raise the pressure in the heart, I raise that side of blood pressure, I'm going to get more flow, the blood's going to move around more easily. That's good, okay? Pressures during exercise, very, very common to see. 180, 190, 200, 220 millimeters of mercury. Things you would really, really have some questions about at rest, okay? Your blood vessels are very, very stretchy. It's not a big deal. Okay. A weird thing happens with diastolic pressure though. Pressure during filling should stay the same during exercise. Sometimes it falls and then you get you may pass out. That's a little bit weird. If diastolic pressure goes up during exercise, you are in dire trouble. You need to go to the hospital right now. Okay. But generally, diastolic stays constant because. There's not a lot that's going to change. When, when the contraction force drives this increase here, stays the same. There's a little bit of an increase in contraction force, but it's offset by misdilation kind of downstream. Now, what I've shown with this red and green, and this is kind of an interesting aside for you guys. I'm not going to ask a question about this. Red represents arm crank cycling, green is riding a bike with your legs. You will note that the smaller the amount of muscle you use during exercise, the more pronounced the increase in blood pressure in an exercise is going to be. Okay? The more pronounced. This is because the, the cardiac contraction goes up, but the smaller the amount of muscle that you're using, the less vasodilation overall there's going to be. So peripheral resistance stays high, and you get this kind of enhanced blood pressure response. How many of you have been to a, when I've worked with PT and I You guys ever arm, let people arm crank cycle to get warmed up? Don't have your old hypertensive people do that. They're getting exaggerated blood pressure response compared to walking or biking. I get sometimes they can't walk or bike because they have lower body issues, but from a blood pressure standpoint, and sometimes the acute change in blood pressure can be related to cardiac, <laughs> cardiac arrest and, and things like that. They're probably better off walking or biking than arm crank cycling. For God's sakes, don't have old people that have high blood pressure do isometric exercise when they do the valsalva on the Okay, during valsalva, when you guys when you guys lift weights, you may get pressure that are in the like three fifty to four hundred systolic range over like two fifty. Okay, fine for you guys, not great for my mom. To have high, high blood pressure like that. So, we teach people when they exercise in older adults don't do isometric exercise because you get a more pronounced blood pressure response. Teach them to try to breathe through everything and do a little bit less stop valve because you get this wildly pronounced sort of response. Okay. Blood volume. Nope, I'm not going to have time to finish this. So, we will clean up the last couple of slides to start on Monday. We'll take our question. All right. You guys have a good weekend. We will see you on Monday.